Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Rowing Chat. It's the podcast for rowers. It's a network of podcasts. And as many of you will know, we now have seven shows on the network. If you're interested in making a show yourself, you might want to do a couple of episodes or you might want to do a mini series. We'd love to hear from you. So please do get in touch. I'm Rebecca Caro, and this is the Rowing Chat interview podcast. It's the first podcast that we started on the entire show. And today I'm going to be joined by Robin Williams. But first, a message from our sponsors. Blake Gawley is one of the presenters of the Strength Coach Roundtable, and he's written a book called The Movement of Rowing, and it explains how movement limitations in your foot and your ankle can affect a rower's performance technique and health. The book is packed full of screening strategies and solutions to help rowers meet their full potential. He's got 11 chapters in the book and it's available in both an ebook and a print book format. If you'd like to get a hold of the ebook, Blake has very generously given a 30% discount to Rowing Chat listeners. Go to rowing.chat forward slash sponsor and you can get the discount code there. And there's also a link to buy from Amazon if you want the print copy. We're doing an audience survey as well on Rowing Chat. And so if you have got a moment, please, could you go to our homepage and fill in the survey? This is your chance to tell us what you like and what we could improve across the whole of the Rowing Chat network. Finding good quality clothing when you're an athlete can be a challenge, particularly for men. Dress shirts aren't usually designed for rowers whose arms and backs are longer and broader than perhaps your average. Introducing William Marnie, the shirt maker for athletes. Their range of dress shirts is designed from the start for an athletic fit for tall and fit men. Each shirt has detailing in style, fit and fabrics that'll change the way you experience shirts, says the founder, Matt Marnie. He's set up a discount coupon for 10% off for any listeners of Rowing Chat. And it's Rowing Chat 10, which you can use at the checkout. Again, pick up the link from our sponsors page. And lastly, Rowing Chat's been uh, selected by the Feed Spot panelists as one of the top 10 rowing podcasts on the web. So we're very grateful. If you want to see the full list, go to blog.feedspot.com forward slash rowing underscore podcasts. Now I'm joined today by Robin Williams. Robin, welcome for the second time to Rowing Chat. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Yeah, and it's a good evening from the UK and I think a good morning with you. Certainly is. Yep, yeah, going to be a nice day. <laughs> now, Robin, would you introduce yourself to the listeners and tell them a little bit about yourself and your background in the sport of rowing? Yeah, sure. Um, well, as you can probably see from my graying hair and my um, uh, slightly lined appearance, I've been uh, in rowing for a very long time. Um, I, uh, I started as a teenager down in, in, in South Wales at school and um, uh, learned my rowing on the River Wye, which is absolutely beautiful, but definitely a provincial sort of setup. And it took us a while before we uh, won any races and started experiencing the, the winning side of rowing. Um, but it was where I, I, I still love the place and I feel um, that's where I fell in love with the sport. Uh, I still keep in touch with a lot of friends fr from Monmouth. Um, I went to London University um, and back in the 80s, London was uh, was pretty much the main main university force in the UK. And that sort of taught me really how to train hard and uh, what performance rowing is really about. Um, so whilst I was at UL, we, we, we won our first Henley medal and I also represented GB as a lightweight rower the first time whilst at uni, which was in the lightweight force. Um, and in those days, GB was pretty strong with lightweight rowing. So I went from there to London Rowing Club and had about 10 years, I think, in the, in the national team um, as a lightweight and picked up a couple of world medals. 
senior world medals there. <clears throat> um, and then in the early 90s, um, I found myself moving into coaching. So I, I became coach at London Rowing Club, um, which was a, a great two or three years and a good learning curve. Um, and then my big break actually was at the end of 94 when I got the job as chief coach with Cambridge University. So I, I uh, relocated to Cambridge with my family and had a, a wonderful 11 years being involved with the boat race. And um, I mean, we can talk about that later if you want, but it's a, it's a fantastic contest um, just because match racing is, you know, you, you, you put yourself on the line and there's no heats and repechages. It's just you sort of live or die on the day, really. And, um, you know, that in a slightly masochistic way sort of appeals to me. Um, uh, so that took us through till 2005, and at which point I felt that I'd always wanted to get back involved with international rowing and with lightweights. And GB wasn't doing so well, really, at that time. Um, in fact, ever since they went into the Olympics in 96, we'd come off our perch a little bit as far as world rankings were concerned. And um, anyway, I, I, I got a job with GB rowing and um, was lead coach for lightweights with Paul Thompson as the head coach. And, and we had a, a successful time. We had a, um, our lightweight four won the world championships in 2007. Um, Mark Hunter and Zach Purchase, who are coached by Darren Whiter, won the world's, oh, won the Olympics, pardon me, in Beijing. And then we, you know, we built up, we built some success back up again. Uh, so that was another episode. And um, in 2017, I made one of my only, I think, two uh, escape attempts to get away from rowing. I say two in about 48 years of rowing. I think um, <laughs> they're never they're never successful. You never get very far from it, you know, because somebody rings you up and drag you. You find yourself dragged back in. Um, anyway, so in 2010, I, I, I moved over to women's rowing and um, was fortunate to be put with the women's pair, H Helen Glover and Heather Stanning. At that stage, they weren't the selected pair. They were more um, sort of the reserves for the eight, but they quickly became the top ranked pair and then had, had six great years with them with Olympic uh, gold medals at London and, and Rio. And then... Um, uh well since since rio i've been involved i suppose more in a sort of consultancy role which has been really fun um very varied and uh i do i do a fair bit of work with the spanish team so i go back and forth to spain where outside of covid obviously being around um and um i do some coach education work in the uk and um have had one or two athletes come over to pay visits and do camps and things with me. And um, so it's quite, it's quite an interesting mix at the moment. So that's a sort of quick run through really. Start, start to finish, Robin, it's fantastic. And what I like particularly is that you've been courageous in stepping outside what might have been considered a traditional pathway, because when you were starting coaching, paid coaches were the exception rather than the rule, weren't they? Yeah, definitely. I mean, when in, I suppose it was about in early 90s anyway, um, life was quite tough because we were in recession. Um, I had a business, a sort of a home-based business, which was struggling. And I picked up a bit of coaching, to be honest, to sort of make ends meet. And and actually realised that this is, this is good fun and it was stimulating. And I thought this is much more a sense of vocation. But as you say, um, there weren't many jobs around and London Rowing Club, which is actually my club, um, employed me as their first professional coach. Um, but it was part time, uh, well, at least they paid part time. But you, there's no such thing as a part time job in, in rowing, really, is there? So I worked a lot of hours, but, um, but I, you know, it's my club and I, and I love doing it. And um, we had a great time. And then and then when the opportunity to go to Cambridge came up, um, I think Oxford, Cambridge and probably a couple of paid positions in the national team were sort of pretty much the only full time professional jobs around. And I felt really privileged to to land one of those. And um, I suppose I was sort of uh, mid 30s or something and had 
you know, uh, had some experience, but they definitely took a risk on me. And when I look back on it now, at the time, I thought, yes, it's my job. My name's written all over it. Actually, when I look back on it, I think, no, they, they took a bit of a, a risk because I wasn't an established famous coach or anything. Um, but uh, as I, I think we're going to speak later, they put some good support around me in, in the, with the likes of uh, Harry Mann and Tim McLaren and, and some other people that helped um, uh, help sort of keep me keep me on track. Um, so uh, and, and of course nowadays, I mean there there is uh, paid coaching jobs uh, all, all, all over the world, and it's a much much better situation and thrilling that people can actually plan it as a career rather than sort of falling into it. Yeah, it is a very substantial change and, and a very welcome one um, because you see everything from gap year students who can go across the world and coach in a school for six months. Um, uh, you know, Henley Stewart supporting the up and coming development talent um, coaching and, as you say, right up to clubs employing part and full time coaches. So I I think it, the, that end of the professionalization of the sport of rowing has had nothing but benefit um, for the sport across the board. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I think at the same time, it brings with it some challenges um, in, 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 it's much more competitive now for coaches. You know, you actually, you, you really need to know what you're talking about. Um, you know, I was in that, transition phase from sort of amateur coaching towards professional coaching and you know if I look back on my own career as a GB lightweight um, I think in in 10 or 11 years we had nine different head coaches you know and that's Ooh. that's what happens in amateur setups is that people give up their time they they, they try their best uh, it didn't work out, so they think, "Well, I've got a, I've got my job to, my family to worry about." So they resign, and you get somebody else in. Um, and I suppose that influenced me quite a bit as a professional coach. I thought, "Well, what athletes rowers want is consistency, fairness, transparency, um, and 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 the feeling that there is a system around them which is supporting them." And I think sometimes uh, in the amateur days it felt much more like a sort of a lottery as to, you thought, well, we had good athletes and they were training hard and they were good people, but sometimes the selection uh, process just went haywire and you just thought, no, nope, the wrong person's in that boat. That's the wrong boat. Um, and sometimes it worked in your favor, possibly when it shouldn't have done. It was just a little bit more of a, a bit more random and, um, so I've taken that with me into my own coaching because I think certainly if you're a professional, you've got no excuse. You should be doing those things with diligence and, and doing them correctly and with planning. And um, and you, in theory, if you're a full time coach, you've got all day to to think about these things. Now, we are live at the moment and uh, we have a welcome message for you from Chris Jones. He says, how Hi. nice to see you. Hi, Chris. Yeah, nice to see you, too. <laughs> if anyone who's watching has a question that they'd like me to put to Robin, please put it into the chat uh, below the live stream window and uh, I will endeavour to feed it into our discussion. Now, you mentioned at Cambridge that you coached with and alongside Harry Mon. Now, for people who don't know Harry, he was a sadly now deceased New Zealander who was a very eclectic coach. He had a very particular approach to making a boat move. Can you tell us a bit about what you learned sitting alongside him in the coach boat, coaching and developing crews for the boat race? Yeah, it was the whole process for me was quite a fascinating one, really. Um, I didn't, I'd never heard of Harry. And um, when I was being interviewed for the job at Cambridge and they said, well, we'll you know, Harry Marn will come over and he'll help you out. and um, you know, being a young, sort of bullish young fella, I thought, well, I'm not sure if I need any help. You know, I'm going to work this out on my own and stand on my own two feet. But it was a good thing that he he did come. So we had the program is six months. Uh, well, the, the boat race bit of the program goes from um, September to sort of end of March, 26 weeks. And Harry at that time was uh head coach for Switzerland. Um, so he was spending most of his time there, but would come and maybe have 
something like six or seven weeks with us total spread out through our program. So he was, a, um, I suppose he was our way of seeing if we were on track and particularly with, a, with our technical model. And I think the first time I met him, I hardly got two words out of him. I mean, he, he was a quiet guy, you know, he was, came across as quite reserved and um, I felt quite slightly intimidated initially. I thought, you know, maybe I'm not liked, uh, maybe he sees me as sort of uh, an interloper because he'd been there helping Cambridge the previous couple of years and very successfully. So I was the new guy. But I realized that he's you no, know, he's just a, a reserved private person until you put a megaphone in his hand and put him in front of a rowing crew. And then there was just this explosion of verbosity and um, off he'd go, you know, and he would he would just coach. Um, I joke sometimes when I talk to coaches about coaching style, I say, you know, you have the quiet reserve coaches who hardly say more than one or two words. And then there's Harry who would have the megaphone here in his hand and he'd pull the trigger in to talk and then an hour and a half later he'd let the trigger go and put the megaphone down and i'd change the batteries over and we'd go again you know and it was um it was quite fascinating so i was uh, and, and he he had a he had a, an amazing touch with the crew uh, quite sort of enigmatic i didn't always understand what the hell he was talking about or why are you coaching on that particular point but at the same time, you could see that there was some sort of magic at work there. And it didn't seem like the obvious stuff that you normally hear about and read about in rowing. It, it's, he seemed to really tap into the minds and the thinking of, of the crews. And, and I found that very fascinating um, to, be, to be part of. Um, and, and I have to say, you know, I... Uh, for a little while I thought this is this is it this is the style of coaching this is how it's done and that's how I want to be so I tried to slightly mold myself uh in Harry's style and I have to say it backfired completely it, it didn't work because um when I started talking like Harry did sort of like a machine gun uh, it seemed like that the rowers were just going whoa 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 Robin, stop, you know, we can't keep up. You know, you've said this, now you're saying that, you know, uh, you know, you're trying to talk us through this, but I haven't got time to think and you sound grumpy and da da da. It just didn't, it wasn't me. Um, and I thought, okay, well, every coach is going to be a little bit different. Yeah. And um, it's not a matter of copying. It's a matter of um, f figuring it out. Why is Harry good at getting his message across in his particular way? what can i sort of glean from that but don't don't copy it because it doesn't work um so so that was an early lesson and 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 actually as as the years rolled along of course i got to know him better and better and um um you know i think we would call ourselves close friends by the end but i think he he was always disappearing off to coach somewhere else he'd go to south Africa or we'd go you know Switzerland South Africa or he did coaching back in New Zealand or with Shawnigan Lake School in Canada and so uh, you never had too much of a chance to really um, spend more than a you know a week or 10 days uh, with him but um, but a really interesting guy and, and in the context of the coaching team at Cambridge it seemed to work you know because um, Harry was the visiting coach so uh, when he when he came in the building, we'd all tug our forelocks and sort of we're not worthy kind of thing. Um, we had we had a lot of respect for him, and he definitely had the touch of magic with our with our group. I was there to sort of plan and be do the boring stuff. To be honest, you know, plan the training, organise mini buses, um, do the gruesome bit when it comes to dropping people, or, or the nice bit when it comes to selecting people. Um, Ian Dryden was there in the coaching team and, and also on the operational side and Ian made every day fun and kept a certain sort of levity in what could be a fairly hard, you know, you could make life really pressured for yourselves when you know you've got six months and their students and 200,000 people are going to watch you row on the day and a few million people on TV. You know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, a real pressure cooker. And, and, it, and it, it, you, you know, Ian was great at just, um, 
releasing pressure from the system, if you like, in the coaching team. And, you know, Donald Leggett, who is just completely eccentric. Um, you know, it was a funny mix of people. None of us were the same. Tim McLaren would come over once or twice from Australia. And Tim was very sort of, you know, quiet, meticulous, thoughtful kind of guy, a real technical guy. You know, so everybody was a bit different, but it was a formula that, that really worked. And, um, uh, and uh, you know, I, I mean, I loved it there. I mean, I, it, after 11 years, um, you know, I didn't, in, uh, well, I didn't really need to leave. I didn't want to leave. I sort of felt from a career point of view that it would be the right thing to do. And, and I'm not sorry that I moved on to other things, but, um, but it was a great, it was a great thing to be involved with. And Harry was a huge part of that. Your coaching style is now very defined. Um, you, I'm sure, have moved on from those early days. Can you talk us through the things that you believe, if someone saw a crew rowing, they would be able to say, Robin coached them? Well, I'd love to think that was true. I'm not sure if they'd spot, if they would identify it that way. But, um, yeah, it's, it, you know, I think this is, it's an interesting one, Rebecca, because um, I was listening to a webinar recently um, and there was some quite high profile coaches um, week by week speaking. And the, 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 the normally people say, OK, well, tell us what are the characteristics of your crew or your country or your regime or whatever. And they say, oh, well, you know, we 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 try to row a long stroke and it's leg driven and, you know, and I just think, well, yes, but that's what we all try and do. Um, it doesn't really describe the style. Uh, um, I think, I think in those Cambridge days, it would have been, it would have had length and it would have had, um, you know, a good, a good leg push going on. But I think the characteristic was synchronization, relaxation, uh, creation of rhythm, really. So the crew was uh, committing a lot physically, but they looked, uh, they made it look easier than what, what it actually was. I mean, they weren't necessarily always winning, but but they were rowing with a, a style of rowing, which I think we, we tried to, it had to be efficient because it's a 7,000 meter race. You know, it's not, um, you can't really get away with um, gaps in your in your technique or or weak links in, in the eight. Um, I think back in, you know, it's quite interesting when you look at technique over the decades. Um, in fact, I've got a, I've got some Cambridge video from the 1930s. Well, I suppose it's cine. Uh, and it's fantastic, you know, short slides and bodies cranked right over. Um, but very, very disciplined, really, really tidy blade work, fantastic posture, um, black and white, you know, as you can imagine it. And it looks quite quaint, but actually, when you look at it as a quality of technique, it was very good. Um, in the sort of 40s, 50s, that that traditional style largely carried through. When you get to, when you see video of the boat race from the 1970s, everybody's hair has got down to their shoulders. Everybody's got these long slides, so the seat is maybe you know a couple of inches from their heels. So they're very over compressed, very rounded, sort of overstretched backs. Um, and they're making the boats go fast because they've got this extra length, but it's not it's not the most attractive rowing. And then through the 80s and 90s, you know, it's it's all shaped up. And of course, they've done all the um, sports science and the biomechanics now. And we know much more about, um, you know, muscle groupings and leverage and this sort of thing. So I, I think most of the leading nations now look much more similar than what they what they used to. But I, I still see a lot of energy wastage. Um, you know, I, I, I think slightly sadly, it's still true that if you train like absolute hell, you'll beat a crew that's training a bit less, even if technically they're better than you. It's just it's a sport that rewards physique and physiology massively. But I, I, I think we'd all as coaches have to take the view, well, when all of those parameters are level and you've got the same physiology, the same fitness, you've done the same kilometers, lifted the same weights as everybody else, the margins are going to be in technique and mentality and uh, efficiency. Um, so that would be the, if someone was going to say, well, that's a Robin Williams crew, I would hope that they would see uh, an efficiency um, in, in the crew and, um, 
I, I also think I, because I, you know, I wasn't a superstar rower myself. I, 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 I have an affinity with people who are good, but maybe not brilliant. I, I always sort of say, if you take the absolute best athletes and, you know, in, in GB, of course, we, we'd cite people like Steve Redgrave and Matthew Pinsent, you know, but I think you could put them probably in any boat type um, and they'd win. Um, you, know, you know, they, they just were amazing. Athletes. And, and, and actually on technique videos, there may be sort of little mechanical things which you think, well, they're a bit rounded here or a bit bent on the arm there, but actually the effective end of it on the oar and how the boat's traveling is absolutely superb. But, but, you know, they're almost kind of immortals, you know, they're, they're just superhuman people. And mo most people in rowing who maybe aren't quite as gifted, um, they can still win medals and still do very, very well. And, um, but they have to exploit every advantage that they can. And I suppose that's why I love the six years I had so much with Helen Glover and Heather Stanning was because they're sort of middleweight, middle-sized athletes with great athletic ability, but um, they, we had to really make the boat sing, you know, to use this sort of cheesy, <laughs> cheesy old saying. Um, it just, it just had to fly, you know, we couldn't afford to have any, um, or, or we just needed to minimise any negatives in, in the rowing. So we, yes, we tried to row long. Yes, it was on the legs, but it, it had to be effective and efficient and ha have an economy as well. It's one a very long things, way of not answering your question, I think, that one. <laughs> well, one of the things that you have experienced through the time span of your career, as you mentioned earlier, is the rise of sports science and the deep knowledge and insights that specialist professionals now bring to a national program such that I am guessing a physiologist is very much in charge of part of the program for a group of athletes rather more than a coach or a head coach might be. What are the things that you've really seen that have been big changes that have been supremely beneficial in an Olympic program? Um, yeah, well, that's a good question, isn't it? Um, I, I suppose if I if I talk about what happened, you know, when I left Cambridge and joined the GB team at that stage, the National Training Centre at Caversham wasn't open. So um, I had a small trailer behind my car with a dozen singles on it for the lightweight guys, and I'd tow it around to Henley or Marlow or Pangbourne or down to Dorney or wherever I could blag a bit of water for a few days. Once Caversham opened and we were into the training centre, that was a step on for sure. So, I mean, Britain's a smaller country, centralised training work can work here. Bigger countries like Canada and Australia, um, you know, in the US, it's more of a challenge. Um, but that, that was one thing that made a difference because you can obviously pool all your resources in one building so the rowers they turn up they've got um, somewhere to stretch before training um, if we want to take uh, you know blood lactates we can do that easily if they need physio it's it's up the flight of stairs and you're in the physio there's a doctor there you know all of this all of the support around them was fantastic so the quality of their rest i think was mm -hmm is crucial so you know if you're going to train three times a day and sometimes people push that out even to four the limitation really is how much you can recover and nowadays that the athletes um can be full-time or if they want to be semi full-time um they've got this chance to train hard and recover whereas you know back in the amateur days we talked about before We'd train at six in the morning and be off to work by eight, do a full day's work and come back down at six in the evening and crawl into bed. You know, just permanently tired and never really recovering. So I think I think there's much better understanding of um, athlete care from a, sort of from a health point of view. Um, I think what's come with that is they've realised that lifestyle balance is quite important, too. I mean, people aren't machines. And um, I know talking to some friends in uh, in Canberra who've been through that institute experience there, we know when it was set up in the late 70s, I think they just thought, fantastic, it's like a kind of an athlete farm. You can all live here. You've got your accommodation. Everything's on site. And people just go a bit nuts. 
you know, you need you need a bit of a life as well. You need to disconnect from sport and from rowing um, from time to time. So I think we've got much better at that as well. Um, mm -hmm. In, ter in terms of what's actually pushed the standard up, um, I, I guess every every year that the head coach writes the program and you go through the training and the tapering and the competition and you know if it works, you build on that. If it doesn't quite work, you you know you, they've got a better and better idea of what it is that they need to tweak um, tweak next time. And um, uh, uh, you know, obviously, <coughs> sometimes you've done a great program and you still haven't won um and it can be it can mean you know just um a talent pathway so uh again in the uk you know from soon after 2000 peter shakespeare came over from australia or was was uh um you know brought in by by british rowing to set up the um the start program um you know it's those sorts of initiatives which i think just maintain quality year on year and it's sort mm. of I guess if you get it right, it's a bit like a conveyor belt of even though you get some retirements, you've got some good fresh talent coming in and you've got, you know, people like Jürgen Grobler and, um, you know, been involved for many, many years now. And Paul Thompson's now with China, but he was there for 18 years. Um, that provides that stability, which didn't exist, you know, 20, 30 years ago. What sort of uh, individualization of programming comes through to an individual athlete? In, in a sort of GB or Spanish setup, do you mean? Yeah. Um, I think to an extent it, it can do. I mean, obviously, when you're erging and land training, it can be completely individualized. Um, in, in the boat, I, you know, clearly, you know, you have to do what's right for the boat. So um, that that, that is, uh, is actually quite an interesting subtlety of this because I can think back, you know, 10 years, maybe 15 years, when the emphasis in GB was very much, look, here's a program, there's science behind the program, um, and if it says you're, uh, you're working at this heart rate or at this physical intensity, that's what you should do. Mm -hmm. And so people put themselves in the hands of the program and trusted it. And the only snag with that is that if you, if you um, let's say if you're technically uh, not very efficient so actually you can you're meant to row around the up and down the lake with a, a split of say two minutes 10 per 500 but you can only make two minutes 15 otherwise you're over pulsing you're training at the right level but you're never going the right speed right so um i think actually nowadays like if i was writing the program i would say well look some days yes we'll train towards the correct physiology but other days we'll train towards the required boat speed because you have to learn how to make a boat go at the right speed so if you spend the whole year rowing around with a 215 split yeah. you're not going to win you're never going to make the grade you're all training, but you're not going to win yeah. um and, and some coaches go very much the other extreme and they just almost ignore the physiology until somebody keels over and they say okay you're a bit tired you better rest up you know it's a it's a common sense mix i think of um of of the two approaches deeply rooted in experience now one of our watchers i sadly don't know their name has said what did you change between the london olympics and the rio olympics um what did we change uh i think one of the things that carried on evolving with uh, with the women's pair was the 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 the, the pacing of the race um the race profile if you like um so i used to do uh i mean be bearing in mind that helen glover was even in london in rio in london had only had uh about two and a half years of rowing under it maybe get, getting towards three years but not long in the sport um and we felt there were still sort of vulnerabilities in 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 their race profiling. They were quite fast off the start, but um, we wanted to sort of make sure that wherever the threat was going to come from another crew, we were we were ready for it. The Kiwis were fantastic and always battling um, there uh, with Juliet and Re Rebecca, um, and um, and the subsequent pair, the current pair. 
the Americans yes. every time would throw out combinations from their eight con con constantly. Um, so we uh, we used to do sessions. Um, I have a slide sometimes which I sh show coaches of uh, if you can imagine a two thousand meter an aerial view of a two thousand meter lake with all the lanes going down it. And I, you know, I say right, you know, imagine if one lane is for technique, one is for physiology, one is for technique um, mentality, one's for tactics. And with Helen and Heather, we would sometimes usually row a something like a, 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 a U one. Uh, kind of piece so maybe you know rate 21 something with a bit of pressure and I'd be on the radio beside them and we might just talk the 2000 meters through from a um, from a technical profile and then on the next lap we might do it from a, um, a, a tactical profile or on another lap from a, a physiological profile just so that ultimately when they come out to race it's obviously a hybrid of all of those things and in a race from start to finish there are times when you're, um, you know, times when you're fresh, times when you're tired. There's times when you're trying to take charge tactically, the times when you're defending, times when you have to pay a bit more attention to tweaking the technique or the rhythm. You know, you're multitasking, but we'd split those out into separate streams and try and think, OK, well, um, if we're at 750 or 1400, you know, what are we what are, what what are we trying to do here? Um, you know what? If, if we're going to try and make sure we keep control of the session. So I think of, uh, yeah, of the session and ultimately of the race. So I think we got um, much better at that. But having said that, the, the Rio Olympics themselves were, were tough. You know, I mean, we, we weren't quite as dominant as we were in 2012. Um, and I think that's largely because, you know, the Danes produced a good pair. Um, New Zealand were we're still pushing hard australia were coming up the americans were tough you know and i think the standard has carried on closing up and and tightening up since i mean it's, it's great for women's rowing um and also i'd say going through to rio i mean obviously physiologically with um with uh four more years um we could get them a, a little bit fitter and a bit stronger but heather had 2013 out of the sport because she was serving right. in afghanistan in the army so Polly Swan came in. So we had, the, there were just different things going on. And of course, the biggest difference in Rio was that um, we had huge pressure to win. Um, in London, we got in underneath the radar, you know, and we, we, we nabbed that first gold medal for GB and the first gold medal for the games. And suddenly all the fireworks went off and it was absolutely fantastic. Um, in Rio, UK sport and the government, you know, they 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 obviously look at these statistics and they say, well, this sport, where where are the good medal chances? And they they pointed to Helen and Heather and they say, well, they're they're a solid medal chance. So they're on somebody's list in an office, they've got them ticked with a possible gold medal. And that really makes things a lot tougher um, uh, in terms of people's expectations. And and you know, perhaps if you're um I remember in Rio, actually, you know, in, in our heat, I don't know if you remember that race, but the, we, the the Danes were on the far side from us and they led us to 1750 metres and we squeaked past them at the end. And we had a um, coaches meeting, you know, that evening or the next evening and people said, OK, Robin, what is that? Uh, are the Danes yeah. going really fast? Are we are we are we are we tripping up here? Um, and uh I felt like I sort of earned my money that week uh, because we weren't going badly, but I think we'd yeah. probably just not quite got the right emphasis in the racing, which we put back in for the semi-final. So, yeah, lots of dimensions to this. Now, you have mentioned that you're now a consultant coach and it's been widely mentioned on the internet that you've been seen coaching Mahi Drysdale in uh, recent months before lockdown. Um, now, he's an incredible athlete in and of himself. And, of course, trying to achieve a very, very tough goal of taking a single skull to the Olympics as a man who's over 40 years old. So how do you approach someone like that? Who I'm guessing you've never personally coached before. What happens? Day one, there's young Robin and young Mahi on the riverbank. Yeah, well, I, I, I suppose... 
Uh, the first thing I should say is obviously, you know, Mike Rogers in New Zealand is, is Mahe's coach. And Mike, uh, hi for listening. I hope you're getting better quickly because he had a, a, a nasty car accident a few months ago. Um, yeah, so, you know, Mahe over the years has come to the UK quite a bit because he, he's trained um, with Alan Campbell and um, you trained with people like Olaf Tufter and others. So I think he quite liked... Um, uh, setting up his own training environment at certain times of the year and um once or twice in the past you know i mean i've known him for quite a long time and um we'd, we'd sort of talked about this i suppose in passing just over a coffee anyway now it was possible so he's he's done a couple of a couple of short camps and i uh, it, it was very enjoyable um i, I have to say the first time you can't help but think to yourself, well, here's somebody with, um, you know, two Olympic golds, an Olympic bronze, half a dozen world championship gold medals. Um, you know, what what am I what am I going to be able to say um, and add? And and also knowing what I was like, you know, at, at, in my early forties, um, I think there is the risk that the older you get, the less you you want to change or can change. Now, Mahe is not like that. Mahe, Mahe I think, uh, said very early on, look, I, I, I'm still, he is still physically fantastic shape. Um, but he said that's not maybe going to be my sort of guaranteed edge over everybody else. I mean, there are some younger guys coming up and who knows, they might be, they might be similar, they might even be stronger. I think he's just, he was just looking at it and thinking, well, I've, I've got to try and make sure that I'm looking at everything now not um um you know n not relying on you know as we know the, the new zealand program over the years has been amazing i mean fantastically fit people uh, with you know um, big mileages and and um i think they've really sort of shown the world you know from that preparation of athletes sort of what can be done um so i so i think when in the first few sessions we did i mean it was it was a matter of looking and and actually getting some conversations going because you know i needed to see well what's his motivation what does he want from me uh, how can i help him and actually if i look at a rowing stroke of anybody i mean there's there's dozens of things you can say i think the trick is picking out the key thing it's deciding well what are the priorities here um so it, th as the days went by and we had more of those conversations we looked at more video of course it uncovers more of the thinking and then and then you think okay well now i'm maybe in a, a bit of a position where i can suggest things and perhaps help um mm. because i understand you, you need to know a little bit about the person's philosophy towards their rowing frankly you know um and uh i think if you don't know where people's minds are um it, you're just looking at literally what's in front of you and you know, I, I think if people think the right things in rowing, then usually the technique will develop along those lines. If someone's thinking about, you know, um, good balance on the front back turn and, you know, um, uh, making sure that they're, you know, light on the stern of the boat or whatever it is, you know, if they're thinking those things, then that then their subconscious will be working out ways of achieving it. Um, and, you know, some people, I think, well, you know, some people in rowing just uh, will have a different a different agenda. They'll just be thinking, I'm going to crank the hell out of the handles and I'm going to rate higher or train hard or get a bigger ergo or whatever it is. Um, Chris Jones um, just remarked that uh, he's from New Zealand and he said, I certainly perceived a difference in Mahi's sculling this year after you had a crack at him. I think that's a compliment. <laughs> that's very kind of Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it was it was it was very enjoyable, and um, you know, as I, as I said, I mean, if you looked at video of Steve Redgrave and, Math and 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 Matthew Pinson from back in the nineties, you could you could pick quite a lot of holes in 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 that boat from a sort of te open a textbook and talk about technique sort of point of view. But they were multiple world and Olympic champions, you know, and I think you know some you just I would look at Mahe's boat, you know, for instance, but I always try. With whoever I'm coaching, I try to resist looking at the person or the crew first. I try and see how I think the boat is going through the water first, because 
you know, they might be they might have great technique, but actually the boat's just not going or vice versa. They might look a bit, you know, rough around the edges or miss sequencing or something, but the boat's traveling well. So try I try to see how make an opinion, force myself to have an opinion about is this boat traveling well? Is it is is the is the speed being picked up around the front end and um, is there a sort of synergy to it? Um, and and then probably next I'd have a look at the blades and because obviously the blades are the tool with which we we move the boat. And yeah, I think most most people would um, well everybody's pointed out to me. Oh, Mahe, he goes deep on the front end, doesn't he? And Mahe says that himself, you know. Yeah. So that was something that we had a look at, and uh, you know, I, I you know we agreed that in theory you don't want to go deep because it's um it, you want to be trying to connect horizontally and all that um and we, we found a couple of ways of i think making a, a bit of a difference with that um so so the third the third thing i come to really is looking at the person and then say right so the boat is this is this is the state of play with the hull this is how they're handling the oars this is what the person's doing what is it that we're going to try and um work on now and and um uh, uh, target as, a, as an area of improvement um and then and i'm sort of drifting off into a little bit of my sort of coaching uh education a bit here because um when i when you look at rowing technique i i you have to try and make sense of it because there's a lot of stuff in a rowing stroke um i mean it's very simple in principle but in a, in a wobbly boat in conditions and with interactions of people it's actually quite complicated um, so I, I try to look at Mahe from the point of view of mechanics. So what are the angles, sequencings, um, uh, and all the things that are, that are observable. And then trying to take a leaf out of Harry Marne's approach, which is to really then try and look inside the individual, look inside how, how is he thinking about moving the boat? How, how do I think the boat feels to him? How does the work feel? Does it feel heavy? Does it feel willing um you know it's it's a little bit of both both and um the mechanics and the feel or if you like a little bit of the sort of the measurable science versus a little bit of the artistic side of it and i think if you can tap into both well then um i think it's quite a quite the athlete's quite motivated and quite enjoys a sense that it is it is it is factual but it's also there's a little bit of chemistry there as well I love the way that you approach the athlete and their history and their personal attitude and approach, because the more I row with more different people, the greater awareness I have of the unbelievable diversity of thought that in enthusiastic amateurs in a master's squad like where I row, people are extremely different and understanding what will encourage them to move towards maybe a blended stroke because you're trying to put together a quad or an eight um, is a massive skill. You're, you're a, a sleuth uh, and a psychiatrist all rolled into one. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's true. Um, and I think it, 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 it sort of, the important thing is to is to maintain a, a, a curiosity and a humility because um again you know i mean we're, we're all where we are because of the pathway we've had through the sport you know it, it puts a certain stamp on the way we row or the way we coach and in the mid 80s i've I'd, I'd been rowing as a lightweight in gb for seven or eight years um and doing okay and i was on one occasion, we were in a, in a lightweight four with a guy called Mike Dizerins, who was um, had stroked Oxford in the boat race. He was a tall lightweight, six foot three or so. You know, um, my God, that rhythm was like a dream. It was like nothing I'd rode with behind before. I, I just thought, what have I been doing all of these years? It was an absolute light bulb moment for me because this boat absolutely flew and. Um, of course, you know, you still got tired, but it was the speed was just pouring out of that hull. You know, we were instead of being level with crews um, that we'd been racing the previous year, we were two lengths up on them at 500, which is probably too much, you know. Um, wow. But it made me think, maybe think. Pretty well, nice okay, well, well, a nice feeling. And of course, but as I say, nothing comes for nothing. But it made me think, well, don't assume, don't assume that you know stuff, you know, be looking for what you don't know. 
and and you never you're never going actually going to discover all the the, the the sort of secrets and nuances of rowing. There's always more because there's no such thing as perfection. So I I think that's the fascinating beauty of it is that um, people spend uh, you know in uh, their whole lives and go on into it in old age and they're still looking for that elusive row where they think yes it all came together and it looked right and it felt right and um so I th so i think with coaching um i still carry big doubts in my head about what well, am i seeing it right am i coaching it right you know i i, I questioned myself pretty hard when i was looking at mahe and i wanted to make sure that what i was saying was gonna not be at odds with uh, with mike and his coaches in new zealand so you know we were speaking on the phone from the uk but I, yeah there's certainly a a responsibility in being asked to do a sort of a guest coached appearance like that because you could you could really stuff it up you know and make a take him off down some route which is completely inappropriate yeah and also unsustainable because one of the things that i personally remember from harry Mann was there was a distinct harry effect he would come he would coach you your boat speed would increase and then it would reduce because you were not getting the daily inputs um, or the regular inputs that to continue to enhance and upgrade your skill because your skill wasn't sufficiently bedded down that you retained it. And as you rightly say, you do a guest coaching, even if you do increase the boat speed at some point, you're handing the athlete back to their regular coaches, their regular training environment. And I would say it's incumbent on you to ensure that continuity is possible. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, you know, I think when when it was time for him to jump back on the plane and uh, I think it was literally the day before everything got shut down. So luckily he made it back home. Um, but what I hope what well, he went away with was a little notebook and some jottings of conversations about not necessarily just a specific thing about how to, you know, position your hand or your shoulder or something. It's, it's about the the, the thinking that's driving the technique and um uh so it, uh, you know hopefully I, I you know heard from him the other day and um i mean i think they're beginning to get back out on the water now um it's it's obviously this whole isolation shutdown thing has just sort of stopped everything in its tracks which is a shame because you know you're trying to get some momentum going and, uh, and the same with the spanish i mean i was should have been over there three or four times this year as well and haven't managed to be over there with them um, so it's pretty tough for everybody. It is. Now, Robin, your new project is um, coaching education and education for athletes. And you've set up a Facebook page called Williams Rowing Coaching. Uh, the URL is on the screen and I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, I'd like to show the listeners a little bit of what you've been putting up in terms of videos. Can you give us some context about why this is your new program? Well, the, these actual videos are are a in the UK for a couple of years. Um, so I've worked with something like three hundred coaches now. Um, when when this was no longer possible with with coronavirus, I thought, well, let's let's try and make a, a series of fairly short videos. They're about ten to fifteen minutes long. Um, and they're just out there, you know, free for anybody to have a look at and agree with or disagree with as they see fit. But um, but uh, it's it's quite, I think it's quite good for coaches to, it's, it's quite tough making a video ad lib, you know, because I have to do it on my own, stopping and starting the camera and um, to try and speak in a way which makes sense and gets one or two points across and not waffle too much, which is what I do. Same when you, when a coach tries to write stuff down. I mean, you can't describe rowing very well in a book or in, a, in, a, in an article, but it's very therapeutic to try and do it, to try and think, can I get some sort of message across which will chime with people? Let's so um, have I've done six or seven of these videos and there's a few more to come and hopefully then we'll all be able to go rowing for real. That is something we can definitely look forward to. Now let's have a look at uh, one of the videos that Robin has shared. This one is about timing and time. 
to we need to have time in the stroke. But I think a really important um, principle or buy-in is that we need to create time, not not take it, but to create it. So if we have good acceleration here and the good movement through the first of the recovery here, the boat will glide back to us and the boat will effectively do the work. If we don't accelerate enough or we don't recover the first part well, well then we have to go to the boat and uh, that means that uh, it's less relaxed, we've got less control, things happen in a more compressed time frame and again we're, we're hurried. So we need to, we need to generate time and uh, through the acceleration, through the first part of the recovery and it's something that we, we earn the right, if you like, by doing good honest work. Yeah. So that's a little flavour, um, slightly delayed, sorry, um, internet speeds aren't brilliant. Uh, but watchers can pick up the full series at Williams Rowing Coaching and an opportunity, each one's about 10, 15 minutes long. Is that right, Robin? Yeah, yeah. I, I try to keep them reason, reasonably short because I think um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a more reasonable expectation on people and... Um, and, and as I said, stops me from trying to go too far with any one thing. But they, they I, what I've tried to do is sort of make them follow in a, in, a, in a logical order. So the very first one I did was to do with the the back end of the of the stroke and sequencing, and then I think we went to the power chain, the legs, trunk, arms stuff, um, and then there's one on drills, a couple on the recovery, this one on timing and time, and then we're moving along with things like. Um, you know, rhythm and connection and so on. So I'm hoping at the end of it, if, for people that find it useful, that there's a like a it's sort of like a little mini series, which is fairly logical in the steps it's taking. And um, one or two, one or two coaches I know who've been using it, who have juniors. In fact, last week I was a day late with the video, and they were they were a bit cross because they said, well, normally it comes out on a Friday, so on Saturday morning we have a session, and we show this ten minutes to our kids, and then. And then off we go for another hour. Um, you know, they're actually basing a session around my video, which I had, I had no idea. Um, but um, but that yeah, that's the aim. It's sort of an innocent little little mini series, but hopefully we'll just get people chatting a bit and discussing some of these themes. So opportunity for everyone to use and then try to put it into practice in their own situation, whether they can row on the water or on the earth. Yeah, and and uh, I mean, I happen to have a, a dynamic concept ergo here, and I've, I've said on the videos um, whether you use concept or uh, ideally, I'd have, I'd be doing some of them on an RP3 because I think it's a great machine, and um, I just don't have access to one in the shutdown. But um, I'm hoping actually, if 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 they loosen the chain on us a little bit in the next week i might be able to do an episode or two on a, on a row perfect which would be great uh, it's not about the type of ergo it's just that i think static ones and dynamic ones offer slightly different opportunities to get points across fantastic now steph cullen has been watching you yeah, obviously I know her and she says robin one of my favorite coaches ever <laughs> when did you two coach together uh, well, Steph was in the lightweight women's quad in 2011, I think, when they won. And uh, I wasn't actually the crew coach, but she was a London Rowing Club athlete as well. And um, so, we, you know, we were on the team together, although I, I, I'm not sure I can claim to have um, contributed to her stardom. But, um, but nice, to, nice to hear from you, Steph. Fantastic. Robin, thank you so much. It's been an absolute delight. You've given us such insights into your thinking process that are totally relatable. They enable people like myself who coach a bit and row a bit to think about things that we might try on ourselves. I'm a great believer in trying things out in my own boat first before I impose them on other people. Tell the listeners where they can contact you if they have any further questions. Um, I, I, well, I suppose the, uh, the on, on the Facebook page, of course, people can leave messages there. And I do I do try and um, respond if anybody um, messages that way. Um, 
uh, also my my Gmail is usable, which I'm not sure you've got that, haven't you? It's uh, Williams r dot coaching at gmail dot com. Um, so there'd be the there'd be the two the two main ways, I guess. Yeah. Thank you very much again, and to all of our listeners. Please remember to fill out our audience survey. I would really appreciate it if you could grab a cup of your favorite beverage and spend five minutes telling us what you like and dislike and where we can improve. And from myself, Rebecca Caro, this has been the Rowing Chat podcast interview with Robin Williams. Till next time. Bye bye. <laughs>